It is Tuesday, April 6th. I am Guy Adami, joined as always by my dear friend Dan Nathan. The macro setup brought to you by our presenting sponsor, Nadex, North America's fastest growing exchange for binary options, call spreads. And Dan, I will spare you this time. Knockouts, <laughs> Dan Nathan. How are you today? I'm doing well, Guy Dami. We are in a market rampage here. Just oh, yeah. Busting oh, out. Oh, yeah, above we are. All those prior highs. We're getting Q2 started um, with a bang, it looks like. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity. You know, you just said Nadex is, uh, specializes in the call spreads. That's probably what you want to own in this environment, huh? Well, in this environment, you, you know, with volatility coming in the way it is, options are getting cheaper, right? So if you're a buyer of calls, I mean, those options get cheaper and cheaper. And oh, by the way, when the market goes up every single day, uh, this is working to your benefit. So I would say well done. But, you know, there's so many great things out there. We talk about them all the time. There's so many headwinds as well. But we had Tom Lee on CNBC's Fast Money last night, and he talked about, you know, I, I understand that producers want to produce. And yep. we talked about a face-ripping rally. That was the headline. You know, I don't think it's really a face-ripping rally. Tom saw another three for three to four percent the upside by the end of April, and I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't characterize that as face-ripping. But I got to tell you, given what we've seen over the last, you know, couple weeks, last few months, I mean, three percent seems pretty reasonable and pretty tepid given what's been going on, Dan. Yeah, you see the S&P 500 obviously closed at an all-time high yesterday, up 9% on the year. That was a great quarter. Uh, a lot of things went well. I mean, like, it's hard to argue. You know, if you're just, like, sitting here and you're not thinking about what had happened in the prior, let's say, 12 months with this mm -hmm. you know, massive economic collapse that was global, and you're thinking about the money that's being pumped into our economy, that's been pumped into our markets, if you think about the savings rate, both consumer and corporate, and then you say to yourself, oh, my goodness, there's another maybe $2 trillion in infrastructure spending coming over the next few years. Um, and then there's going to be a battle over taxes of how to pay for it, which means basically they're not going to figure out how to pay for it. They're just going to print the money. <laughs> and then you say to yourself, well, why would the market, why would the stock yep. market? down right and so we're showing really good relative strength i think to other economies right now the data the ism manufacturing the ism services are kind of off the charts i think they're at like all-time highs from the periods in which they've been recorded over the last you know few decades or so and you say to yourself where else are you going to put your money guy because yeah rates are going up but we got inflation you know kind of moving up a little bit um and real rates are kind of low well in 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 historical terms, real rates are kind of low, but rates, have been, listen, we're going to talk about rates later, yeah. but they've moved up in a pretty precipitous fashion. And I, you know, I find it, you look at this chart and, you know, you just look at it and say, well, that's a nice looking chart. Just put this into context for a minute in, in a year, effectively a year, a little more than a year called 13 months. The S and P has effectively doubled since that March, I believe it was 23rd low of 2190. Just think about that for a second. It has doubled over that period of time. You know what else has doubled, Dan? I'll tell you, because I know you don't know the answer. Basically, the Fed's balance sheet has doubled. So maybe it's coincidental, maybe it's not. But that, to me, is really the, the gist of everything that we're seeing. And here we are at basically 4,100 in the S&P. And, and every person that we have come on, the macro, well, I shouldn't say the macro setup, but every person we have come on CNBC, none of them can really articulate what derails this or what the bear case is. And to me, that is terrifying, but quite frankly, it's been also the right point of view. Yeah, it's kind of, it's interesting that you put it as terrifying when you can't get some of the smartest people who look at markets, whether they be strategists, economists, investors, kind of lay out what they think a bear case is right now. Um, you know, something's likely to happen in the not so distant future. I, I look at this chart and it's kind of interesting if you take out that 35% drop from February 2020 to its lows in late March, right? Mm -hmm. You see a really nice uptrend there. And sure. what, also interesting, though, is like off of those lows, we had some volatility in the fall that was kind of pre-election. It was also this euphoric period that we saw in late summer as it related to NASDAQ stocks. And we saw 2% or 2 10% peak to trough declines. Now, since then, we've had this like steady march higher. And then this year, we've just had basically two 5% peak to trough declines. So I look at that chart and I see it's busting out of two-year technical resistance. I see that it held that one-year very steep uptrend. 
I drew a horizontal line in orange from that September 2nd high, which saw a pretty meaningful sell-off, the largest sell-off that we've had since last February. Um, and that high was interesting to me because it also now matches the 200-day moving average down there at 35.62. So if you tell me there's some reason why the market wants to correct 5%, that gets you back to that uptrend line. And then if it breaks below that, there's really nothing down to the breakout level from October November, which also puts you very near that 200-day moving average. So to me, that's where we're going if we were to correct. So here we are close to 4,100 in the S&P 500, and it would be taking us down towards 3,600. You do the math, that's about 55, uh, 550 points or so. It gets you 12, 13%. Sure. What would be the reason, Guy Dami, that the market, the stock market here in the U.S. would sell off 12, 13% this year? Yeah, I'll give you a couple. If the dollar continues to rally, which, by the way, has done it in, 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 in my face, as Eddie Murphy said famously in Coming to America, <laughs> in the, I mean, it was just a tremendous line. I think that's reason number one. <clears throat> reason number two is something I've articulated for a while. I think if rates continue to go higher at the pace that we've seen, obviously they've stalled here at 170 for the time being. But if rates continue to make this move towards 2%, I think that's yeah. somewhat um, negative as well. And, oh, by the way, we have earnings coming up in a couple of weeks as well. Earnings better be stellar uh, in the wake of some of the moves that we've seen. And I've always thought that earnings matter. And, you know, valuations matter as well. And regardless of what people say, you know, here with the S&P, close to 23 or so times forward earnings, I mean, that's rich in historical yeah. terms. And it's rich when you take into consideration the fact that 10-year yields have gone from 50 basis points to 170 basis points. Right. So let's quickly look at the six-month chart of the S&P 500 because it shows a little different story. It shows a really nice uptrend. It does show that volatility that we talked about. These are really 4 to 5% peak to trough declines, um, and it's found support at the bottom end, and up at the top end would be 4150 But when we're talking about valuation, let's go to the NASDAQ 100 guy. I have a two-year chart of this. I didn't draw. Please. I did Please. not draw a bunch of fancy lines. All I drew was what I think is a technical support level, which brings you back, back down to that 200-day moving average near 1,200. And the high end of that range is a September 2nd high. One of the reasons that the NDX is obviously very important is that the five biggest names in the market make up about, or five or six, about 50% of the weight of this ETF. And you can see that the fact that it's below its recent highs from earlier in the year, that's underperformed the S&P 500 year-to-date. We have not seen that action. But yesterday, we saw Microsoft, the second biggest stock in the stock market, break out to new all-time highs. Amazon, one of the top four names, new all-time high. Excuse me, not Amazon. Um, it was Microsoft. It Facebook. Was Google, the Facebook. Facebook. Yes, those, those three new all-time highs yesterday. And Amazon and Apple, which are still below their all-time highs, are playing a little bit of a catch-up. So what does the NASDAQ 100 going back towards its highs mean to you? And speak to that two-year chart. And then we also have a six-month chart, which I also think is pretty instructive. Well, what it means to me, it means I think people come to the realization that maybe rising rates don't matter for Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, and maybe they can withstand it. And I actually agree with that. I've said it for a while. Those aren't the names you should be worried about in a rising rate environment. It's some of these high-flying valuation names that you should be concerned about. And we've seen some of the air being taken out of their sales. What it also says to me is the market is saying ahead of earnings for all four of those names, which if memory serves, Dan, they all report on April 28th. That's off memory, by the way. Very good job, Guy. <laughs> They're saying, you know what? We're going to get ahead of it this time. We're not going to be left standing bewildered when these stocks rally 8 to 10% post-earnings. So I think a lot of people are getting in front of an earnings release that's coming up over the next couple of weeks. So that's the way I look at this. And maybe they're right. Listen, I know that we've had this discussion on Fast Money. I still think Google, despite the move we've seen, is probably the cheapest of those names we mentioned on valuation and probably, quite frankly, has the most Teflon business model. I think Facebook, as much as I hate the company, I hate everything about it. I've said it all along. There's nothing I like about Facebook except the stock. And we've learned um, hard way, easy way, no matter what you say, that people don't leave the platform. People don't leave the platform and advertisers don't leave the platform. And they've been able to do that in the wake of a lot of really bad news. I will say this because I think it's important. The existential risk, in my opinion, to Facebook specifically, is if they fall under the auspices of ESG investing. If someday somebody wakes up and says, you know what, this Facebook is not good for society, and all of a sudden you get this tidal wave uh, behind that, 
that to me derails the story. Short of that, Facebook is off to the races. Recently, I think an analyst put a $385 price target on it. And given their earnings, given their earnings growth, and giving that math, the valuation at 385 is still, believe it or not, somewhat reasonable. So when I look at this chart, that's what it's telling me. The market finally figured out that the five or six names that sort of drive this whole thing are impervious to bad news, impervious to uh, higher rates, and quite frankly, people are trying to get in ahead of earnings in a few weeks. Yeah, so earlier um, when you started out, we were talking about uh, Nadex and their call spreads, and you mentioned something about a premium getting cheap. I want to flash forward. I was kind of setting you up there. I didn't. I, oh, I didn't, were you really? I, oh, I didn't take you down. I didn't take you down. But let, let's go forward to this um, this article in the journal this morning. Well, hold White on Hot. one second, just before you say anything, yeah. I just want to make. A, I just want to say that. You're the options expert. So you taking me down there, it's, it's like, you know, it's like Davy and Goliath type. Well, of it's not, you know, it's not a big task to take me down on the op options front. But anyway, wait, please continue. You Dan. were just touting your, your fantastic memory because April 28th stuck in your crow about three companies reporting. That's pretty <laughs> impressive. We're going to have to go to the videotape to see if that's actually the case. And in, in, uh, if your memory please. is as you think. But th here's an article this morning in, in the Wall Street Journal, White Hot Stock Rally Mass Mammoth Value Swings. And it's really talking about some of the underperformance of some of these um, maybe viewed as, as kind of high growth, but value tech names. And, and I think this is really interesting because this is something, Guy, we've seen throughout this rally over the last year. It's kind of counterintuitive. As the market kept on marching higher, and easy, even as it was doing in an orderly fashion, that because there was so much optimism about individual names and there were so many individual players and institutions buying calls because of the fairly certainty of the, these stocks going up, the call premiums were actually getting rich to put premiums. And usually it's the other way around. So you could be in a market where you have a VIX that's trending lower into the high teens, right? From the high 20s or something. And you think, oh, option premiums are cheap. If I want to make a defined risk um, bet, let's call it, in an individual name. But you're seeing the premiums and calls creep up and they're getting more expensive. And that's kind of highlighted here. And I just want to kind of read this point. Bullish options um, that profit in individual stocks surge have been growing costlier as investors account for the growing likelihood that shares of certain companies could abruptly jump higher as quickly as they could fall. This is according to Bank America. Investors typically may pay more for bearish options than bullish ones to protect against market crashes. So that tells you everything you need to know about the current environment but i will tell you this that you usually see this phenomenon four times a year before companies report what earnings that would be that would be earnings dan and are you a fan of the odd couple i listen by the way i know i'm getting a little i'm really off the rails today and i apologize a bit, but it's a, a nice bit. look it's a beautiful day out yeah. the yankees won yesterday and oh by the way here's the twerk some of you people the mets found a way another way to ruin a jacob de grom start <laughs> But I don't want to go there. But where I will go is this. In The Odd Couple, there's a great episode where they go on, let's make a deal. And Felix says, pick me, Monty. Pick me. So pick me, please, Dan. I want you to ask me. I want you to pick oh on me. God. Say, you did all of that. You got the Yankees. You got the Mets. And you got the, the odd Grom, couple, Monty. And you Hall. got Felix and Monty in there for absolutely no reason. You could have just well, no. said. Well, I want, you to, I want you to pick me for a second. I want you to say, God, do you have thoughts on this? Oh, Guy, do you have thoughts on this? I do. Actually, you know, you mentioned volatility going lower as people <laughs> buy those call spreads. So the call volume, the call premium is getting more expensive. Oh, by the way, guess what else these folks have learned to do? Yeah. They've learned to sell puts because guess what? The market never gets lower. And by selling puts, you create a synthetic dividend for yourself. And you can reconcile oh. it in your head by oh. saying, you know what? If the stocks get to the level that I sold it, I want to own them there anyway. So that's a double-barreled uh, danger, in my opinion, Dan. How do you like them apples? I do. Let's go to your VIX chart here because you've, you've been kind of identifying the levels where you think it makes sense to kind of maybe lighten up on risk or add risk. What is the VIX below that one year support level mean to you here? It's trading about 18. That's about your, your hat size, isn't it? About 18, guy? No, that's, that's, that's very amusing. Actually, it's probably about my gun size right here. If you oh check God. that out. Put them away. Uh, no, what there, you, you're teaming up for this one as well. And I yeah. say it all the time, and I got to be true to my word. Past support on the downside becomes resistance on the way back up. And we've talked about 20 and a half, 21 since October in terms yeah. of the macro setup when we started. Here we are in April. So that support, which, by the way, was support for many, many months 
now becomes resistance if we ever get back there, which I think we should in short order. But here we are, you know, hovering around 18 or so, which is really staggering if you think about it, but makes sense in terms of what you just said a few minutes ago. So I think the complacency now is manifesting itself in the way people are trading options. You know, stocks only go higher. Let's buy calls. That premium has gotten expensive or more expensive than puts. And oh, by the way, stocks never go down. So let's sell puts because if it goes there, we're happy to buy the stock anyway. That is, Dan, what do we call that? A witch's brew. Oh, my goodness. All right. Speaking of that, let's shift to another article that Please. caught my eye yesterday. This is from Bloomberg. Yield scare that shocks stocks in February barely registers yeah. now. This is this is one. You said the word twerked before that's going to twerk people. Um, don't ever twerk for anyone, guy. Just uh, that, That's just a little Can point. Can I stop you there for a second as well? Yeah. So when twerking became a thing, um, yeah, well, we were doing the CNBC's Fast Money. Yeah. And there was supposed to be a like a like one of these flash mob twerk things. You know, I, you know what the, I, I'm not. Oh yeah, sure, in I'm Times sure. Square, I remember that. Yeah, in yeah. Times Square, and Mel came to me and she goes, "What do you think?" And I said, "If you're twerking, you're not working." And that caught on. Actually, we have yeah. a we have actually one of those sound bites. I know you don't care. That's but well, just you know, that's the only reason why it caught on. That no one ever says that other than you, but they have the recording of it that you said once five years ago. Right. And they, Playing it's actually all. longer than that, but please right. continue, Dan. Okay. Sorry. So, so I thought this article was really interesting. The byline was by Catherine Greifeld. Um, and, and That's I think Bob Greifeld, who used to run the NASDAQ, was our landlord for years. That is yeah. his daughter. Oh, wow. Okay. I love yeah. Bob Greifeld. He's always been a great guest, great market, um, a great market commentator too since then. So here was a quote that I'm just going to pull out here. Stocks should be, should be able to maintain their appeal relative to bonds, so-called real yields. We just talked about this, which strip out the effects of inflation are still deeply negative at minus 64 bips. Morgan Stanley Investment Management's Jim Karen said, if real yields go up a lot and growth is unchanged, then that's a big time tightening, said Karen, a portfolio manager at the firm. If you're going from a 4% expectation of growth for 2021 to 8% expectation of growth for 2021. The real yields go up uh, a little bit. The market can absorb that move. And that's really what we were talking about at the beginning of this segment here, because we were talking about growth expectations are just exploding right now. And yeah. they're exploding relative to Europe and even Asia. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So I just want to bring you now to this one-year chart of the 10-year U.S. Treasury yield, you've been all over this rate rise, guy. I got to give you a lot of credit. You put your foot down in the summer when we were getting towards 50 bips. You said we're going to go up quickly. You said the volatility is going to cause some problems, the bond volatility and other risk assets. But when you look at that move from the August lows to about year end, it looks pretty gradual, right? Doubling from 50 to one. It's yeah. the move from the start of this year to the recent highs just below 1.8% really should be the things that get you twerked or triggered or whatever word you want to use. Yeah, I, I, yeah, triggered is the word. And it's an, well, what the market is doing, it's interesting, this is April, they start trying to summit Everest around this time of year in the spring, typically in May. Yes, and what do. climbers need to do, they need to acclimatize. In other words, they can't climb straight up. They go yeah. to a certain level, they stay there for a couple of days, and then they go to the next level. They get their body, gets used to it. Why do I bring that up? Because that's exactly what's happening no in the market. No. The market is getting used to basically this climb in these altitudes. Now, if we were to go up too quickly, that's going to be problematic. But in the way we're going up, this sort of up four or five basis points, down three, stays around, up another four or five. The market's been able to handle that. It speaks to exactly the article that you just uh, mentioned and just spoke to. So I think it's fine. I do think there's going to be a week, week and a half period where you see the move from 170 to 195.2 in pretty short order. I don't believe the market's going to like that. And I do think it's going to happen. But, you know, what's happened here? Well, the market's got used to these levels and it's fine with it. I don't think it necessarily should be because I still think we're headed higher. But listen. Trade the market you have, not the one that you want. And the market knows a lot more than I do, if you really think about it. I mean, the truth, I say it all the time, price is truth. Well, when I say that, that's exactly what it means. I mean, I can rail against this all I want, but here we are at 170 in the 10-year, all-time high in the S&P, within whisper of the NASDAQ, the Russell getting off the mat, um, VIX below 18. And that's your truth right there. That's your truth, because that's what you have to base your decisions off of, Dan.
Right. And so what we base some of our forward decisions on or the ones that we're investing in now is like what's going to happen next. I look at this chart and I see the old hungry alligator pattern here. Pardon, hold on. So the, pardon me. What was that? The hungry, the hungry alligator pattern here. And uh -huh. so, you know, I think you can see a quick move. I think that 100 day, or the 50 day moving average is down near 1.4. I, I would expect this to come in a little bit, even with the growth expectations moving up here. But here's the 30 year chart guy of the 10 year mm -hmm. U.S. Treasury. 30 year. years. This is on a log basis, okay? So it's it's kind of, we, we got some smoothing action here. But when you look at the volatility since 2010, it's kind of pretty interesting. You do see a bottom, uh, upper left to bottom right here. 2% seems like, you know, a, a was a significant level on many occasions over the last 10 years. But to your point, if you were to really get, if the Fed has lost control, you know, you could see um, the market overshoot and maybe you get back towards that, that long-term downtrend at three percent but again what happened to the stock market guy the last time the 10-year u.s treasury yield in 2018 was at three percent what happened here we go i like when you do this dan go <laughs> ahead so you do it because you like making fun of me please yeah, continue so what happened stock market went down 19.9 percent in a month and a half from yeah. october to december Okay. And then Jerome Powell changed course abruptly yeah. um, because of a number of different things. One, because the stock market did what it did. And two, because he had President Trump on his rear end talking about how the Fed had it wrong. True. So True. I think th that's what happened. So we'll see what happens. Can I ask you a question, though, guys? That's you, what happened. Yes, Dan. Are you the sort of guy who would use that expression six to one, half a dozen to the other? No, like, I've never are, I've never said that in because, my life. Because I've literally I, never I've okay. never said but I've never said wall of worry in my life. I've okay. never said happy. But the reason day. why I've never said, how's your turkey day? I just mean, said it actually. So, yeah. so the point okay. that I'm trying to make is that when you say that the S&P went down 19.9%, like if we're on Wheel of Fortune, aren't you trying to be a little more economical here? Aren't we trying to like kind of shorten things? Why don't you just say 20% in a straight line or something like yeah. that? Because yeah, it wasn't all, 20%. That, it was 19.9%. Okay. But, and but you, probably, you actually go back and, and, and look. As right. Carter Worth says, to the penny. But to okay, penny. going forward, I promise to say 20%. Okay, fair enough. Now, now here, let's move to the dollar, the U.S. dollar index. This is the Dixie because this is one um, you just referred to. You had a great call on this one, um, really from the highs when it was above 100 last year and thought we might be testing kind of those high 80s. We got down there, man. That, that was long-term support. We only have a one-year chart right here. But this is another pattern I think you better keep your eye on because I know that you were kind of, you know, this move against you over the last month or so has been fierce since it broke that downtrend. Trend from the March 2020 highs. I'm calling this the angry serpent formation here, guy. You see what's going on there? We see a little fang coming out of that thing. Uh -huh. This feels like we might, you might get your move back to that downtrend, which could be support, but back towards 90. What would that mean for stocks? What would that mean for rates if we were to start to see the dollar move back towards that, that one year downtrend? Yeah. Well, what should it mean and what will it mean? So, you know, People will say a falling dollar is really bullish. It gives a tailwind to all the multinationals here, so it should be bullish for U.S. stocks. And then the other hand, when the dollar rallies, clearly it's bullish for U.S. stocks. Yeah, it doesn't seem to matter what the dollar does. It's bullish for U.S. stocks. In terms of rates, what should it mean? Well, if the dollar does get whacked here, it stands to reason that maybe rates will be going lower as well, which should be negative for banks. I think we're going to find ourselves in an environment where the dollar has topped out now I didn't think it'd get to where it got. I think it's important to point that out. Like I thought if you'd asked me a couple months ago where we'd be, I would have said south of 88 in the DXY. Here we are at 92 and a half. But with that said, to your angry serpent or fang's tooth or Egypt's asps or those types of things, and notice I pronounce the P in asps yeah, just to make you. sure you heard it correctly. Yeah. So I think a falling dollar, you know, although a lot of people come on and say how bullish it is, I don't think it's particularly bullish, especially if you live in this country and your and your buying power is diminished. So, you know, I think we're topping out here. I think the dollar is going to reverse. By the way, infrastructure bill, where are we paying with that? And a bill on the back end, clearly another one coming. I mean, you have now national debt north of $30 trillion sitting on top of GDP of $21 trillion or so. Unsustainable. Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, we had uh, Raul Paul from Real Vision on our On The Tape podcast last week, checking out the podcast store people. It was really interesting. You asked him that question about debt, and he's a great macro investor. Um, 
And, you know, it just seems that, like, let, let, let's wrap up this section before we get to crypto. Please. I think it's a good segue. You know, it just seems that people, so here's some things that you mentioned that, that stock market investors should be focused on. Valuations, nobody cares, okay? <laughs> Debt, nobody cares. Rising dollar, right, in this really period recently, nobody, nobody cares. cares. Okay, rising interest rates over the last, you know, let's call it nine months, nobody cares. So what the hell are they going to start to care? What is going to be the thing? And, and I guess you could say is like, you know, if there was some hedge fund that blew up, would, would people care about that? You we saw that. Support. We saw that. Oh, we saw that. So, so you're saying nobody cared about that either? You just teed me up for that, didn't you? You sort of, you <laughs> sort of put that right. You dangled that yeah. out front like a I, carrot, hoping I that did. I'd take the bait, which I did. I did. Yes, you saw a hedge fund blow up. Think about, think about this for a second. And I understand it's you know 20 years or so, whatever it is, 25 years later. Long term capital. I think the the realized losses on the back of that. Or I want to say five billion dollars or something which yeah. at the time if you remember i know you do seemingly almost took down the entire banking system i mean yeah. I'm, that's not hyperbole that's fact yeah here we are some unknown listen respectfully some unknown family office uh, you know of which there are hundreds if not thousands the losses some people are talking about 10 billion dollars and it's sort of ho-hum in 2021 and that's a family office. I mean, it's just mind boggling to think that the market doesn't care. It was a one day event. And now we have the VIX below 18. To think that there are not other hedge funds out there with similar risks. Well, it, it, it's, I think it's foolish to think that. It's never just one cockroach. And yes, I added a syllable. You did. Um, all right. Here's one other thing. So like, this is a segue to crypto because I think this is really part of a lot of what's going on. There's been some obviously euphoric sentiment around a lot of different risk assets, but none more in 2021 than, than Bitcoin. It's up you know, nearly 100%. And our friend Meltem Demirs, who's been on our podcast before too, you know, she tweeted this yesterday and she's, she's a brilliant mind. I know you have a ton of respect for her as I do too, but I think it's really funny that you know, we saw this meme stock thing earlier in the year. You know, memes are really important as it relates to crypto also. And she, you know, she tweeted this about cryptocurrencies having an aggregate market cap of 2 trillion. Don't let the suits tell you this isn't an asset class. And you see what I kind of tweet, tweeted back at her literally two hours before the sootiest guy in all of the market, Anthony Scaramucci, <laughs> who is obviously a friend of yours and, and a guy I know. He used to come on Fast Money and we like Anthony. And he's a CNBC contributor again. Um, but I said, here's the problem with that. No suit has said that in 2021. So there's lots of false narratives. Every suit is all in. You can't find a skeptic on crypto right True. now. Which makes me a little curious here. What are your thoughts on that before we go to the charts on Bitcoin and Ethereum? Well, I had a great opportunity to interview Michael Saylor, the founder and the CEO of MicroStrategy. He founded the company in 1989, right out of MIT. The guy's brilliant, literally brilliant. He thinks, you know, a hundred different levels higher than I do, which is probably not saying a lot, but it is no, what it is. Not. And they just announced again, they're up to... 90,000, 90,000 Bitcoin on their balance sheet. And he ain't stopping. And, and he, makes a very, um, he makes a very interesting case um, for why companies should have Bitcoin on their balance sheet and why, oh, by the way, pension funds should have Bitcoin. And oh, by the way, at, at, to your point, $2 trillion for the asset class, $1 trillion for Bitcoin, probably headed to the, the valuation of gold or the market cap of gold, which is around 10 trillion. So I think your tweet though is spot on. There are not a lot of suits out there that are or naysayers. I mean, even a wonk like me sort of gets it. So, yeah. and I get knotted up every once in a while, but I think you added her in a brilliant way. I want to say job well done. Dan. Well, I, we love Meltem and she's great. And, you know, but I, I guess the point that I, listen, I, I like to be a little bit contrarian. I own these things. Um, it's been a good thing. It's, it's kind of, for me, I look at it, if I were to own a position in a speculative stock, you know, but the difference here is that these things have the ability to be cut in half in a matter of days. And that's a very different proposition. And the liquidity is very different. There's also, you know, people keep talking about the potential for regulatory attack, not just by the U.S., by no shortage of other um, countries. So to me, this is not a layup. This is highly, no. highly speculative. And can, and I, just can I just say one thing? I'm sorry to interrupt. This yeah. is important. You know, to think, you know, we talk about leverage in the system, leverage yeah. in the system, this, you know, this, this family office that blew up clearly levered 
if you don't think there's some some leverage going on in terms of crypto, you got another thing coming. I mean, to your point, there's leverage all over the place. Hey guy, so, so guy, if, if you log into your Coinbase account and Coinbase is about to go public, supposedly you yeah, sure. with like a yeah. hundred billion dollar market cap, they basically will give you leverage on your Bitcoin that you own. So you can buy will. Bit more Bitcoin. And then they basically tell you if Bitcoin starts going down below your um, you know, your margin requirement, then they start selling it for you. So <laughs> if you don't think that people in the Coinbase are buying their Bitcoin because everyone's convinced it's going to 200,000 and it's now at 57,000 or 58,000 on margin, you got another thing coming. You make a great point. Let's go to the one-year chart. We only have a couple minutes left here. Um, you know, This thing has kind of held that uptrend. You see that those peak to trough declines keep getting smaller um, as we go higher. 60,000 seems to be a bit of technical resistance. You look at that uptrend in the intersection of basically um, the low from last month. It gets you back towards 50,000. That 200-day moving average is all the way down there at like 30,000. 500 guy that would be a long that way is back. as we say in the business that is more than a few standard deviations higher than the 200 day which by the way it traded at for months and months and months if not longer oh. so again you know we have a few standard deviation event going on here that again nobody you ask me what people care about nothing 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 well, here's what they care about in crypto world more than Bitcoin is Ethereum right now. Now, granted, the market cap is much smaller than that of Bitcoin. But if you look at that performance year to date, that's doubled the performance. It's up more than 200 percent. A lot of that has to do with maybe some of this excitement about um, uh, Beeple and NFTs, non-fungible tokens and the ecosystems that are being created around that. Obviously, DeFi, decentralized finance. Huge, huge area of investment. Lots of protocols are being um, built on the Ethereum network for that regard. So there's a lot of that enthusiasm there. But that just blew through the other day, that prior high, right? We saw that straight line from like 1600 to about 2100. That's a big move in a very short period of time. And again, that 200-day moving average all the way down at 914. Quickly, Guy, will you finish us up in emerging market stocks? We spend a lot of time talking about U.S.-centric stocks, Europe. Europe's obviously gone through the Brexit. They're not doing particularly well with their vaccine rollout the way we are here. It seems like some areas of emerging market, we have the EEM ETF here because it's obviously very heavy China, and we have the Shanghai composite chart after this. What is this EEM chart telling you? Are you looking for opportunities overseas as things seem to be pretty heated up here in the U.S.? And we can end on this because there is a value discrepancy play here, too, if you think that EEM are further behind us or China on the rebound here. And is there a, a cause for a rotation? What does this chart in EEM say to you? So it's before we get out, you know, I actually took the economics in college back in the day. So I remember some of these things. And, you know, I love that Katy Perry song. I talk about it all the time, Wrecking Ball. And we've talked about the U.S. dollar yeah. as it rallies being a wrecking ball. And it's a wrecking ball for exactly the chart that you bring up. It's no coincidence that this thing topped out around the same time that the dollar bottomed out and turned and started to go higher. This, if you really look at it, is sort of inverse of what's going on in the dollar. So if you think, as I do, that the dollar is going to sort of reaccelerate its decline, uh, this EEM chart is very compelling to get through that uptrend line that you talked about. And it might test those levels we saw back in January. However, if you're of the belief that the dollar is going to continue its rally, uh, there's a very good chance you see that 200-day moving average. So to me, Dan, yeah. uh, this is just sort of you got to have a view on the U.S. dollar in order to have a view on EEM. Just my opinion. Okay. And well, you like that. And that Katy Perry song, by the way, she did a great job uh, the other night during the, uh, I think it was the final four over the weekend when she yeah. sang at halftime. Really well done. I her. thought you were going to, the song you were going to reference was Oops, I Did It Again, um, but that might be. No, that's, that's, um, <laughs> that's, that's Britney. I knew that because I saw this special. Anyway, sorry, please continue. Yeah, and just lastly, the Shanghai composite chart is really interesting to me. Um, obviously, this is a, um, a centralized, a centrally planned economy. They have a lot of control over their markets, that sort of thing. But if you look at this chart over the last, let's say, year or so, just a really odd chart. You had that summer move up higher above 3,000, and it's really been range bound. Obviously, you had this little bit of a move um, earlier this year. It held that 200 day moving average. Um, it's just interesting to me, though, that it seems like Shanghai 
composite in particular Chinese stocks may come back into favor. They've cramped down or clamped down on a lot of their internet sector names. We know that those have done really poorly and now they're trying to rein in kind of credit growth. Um, you know, I don't know how you play it other than EEM at this point. So if you were to see that dollar and then that retest in the EEM back towards that 200 day moving average, which is about 48 and a half, maybe that's the entry point just above that breakout in the EEM from back in uh, early November. It's interesting. Again, I mean, you trade against the 200 day moving average for this to the extent that you're so inclined, but you yeah. said, it's funny, just as we get out of here, you said cramp down and, you know, it got me thinking about Everest again, because you wear cramp bonds oh, on yeah. Everest, as you know. So you, you really tied it up very well for me, Dan. So job <laughs> well done. All right, buddy. Is that it? It is yeah, it. I mean, that's, that's it. it. Like this, it goes by. I hope you folks enjoy this. By the way, think about it. We've been doing these since October. We're more than six months into this. We really hope you've enjoyed it. We're not going anywhere, by the way. We'll be back next week for another macro setup. But this macro setup was brought to you by Nadex, the fastest growing exchange in North America. For Ready, Dan, please get ready. Binary options, call spreads, and? Knockouts. Get damn straight. See you next week. <laughs> See you next week, guys.